Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Lord of the Har Harvest Christian Fellowship. This is Pastor Jan. And again, we're um, broadcasting from our home, our humble abode. And um, I wanted to thank um, the Elliots in particular for wishing me a happy birthday and I appreciate that. I wanted to clarify that my birthday is not really officially until 9.30 p.m. Um, it's, I'm sure it was a very happy moment for my parents because previously they had had two miscarriages at about six months. I don't know weeks, but, um, and they were two little girls also. And then they had me. What a, what a surprise, right? And um, remember a funny story that my mom would always tell on New Year's Eve um, because my mom had to have a cesarean section. Um, she was in the hospital probably a long time back then. And then on Christmas Eve, they just had me in my bassinet and they would just stare at me all night and celebrate. So I think that's, to me, a little funny. I also want to wish my grandson, Cole, a happy birthday. He was born on my birthday, so that's like a, it was a present for me. Also, my uh, second daughter, Rebecca, was born on December 17th, and I remember at that time, uh, my husband was working afternoons, uh, my father had died previously, my mom was um, down, um, so it was basically Rebecca and me alone in the hospital. And so she was my gift. I always say she was my birthday present that year. I really want to focus today, though, on the birth of Christ, which is far more important than my birth. And I want us to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And before I say this, before I read this, I should say, I want to say something. Um, men tend to give the least amount of facts around a birth. All women know that. Women get the down and dirt details. We know how long labor was. We know how the mother felt during labor. We know how much the baby weighed, how long the baby was, uh, the name of the baby. We know it all. But you ask a man, they know very little. So I believe in the story of the birth, a lot of important facts have been left out. And so, um, typical man, right? So let's read what it says, though. Many times we just jump to the story and we forget about these four verses in Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So basically, Luke is going to tell us, uh, in his words, how he thinks the birth occurred. Now remember, when he writes, he is taking for granted that we know a lot of things. He doesn't write everything down. So our, our spin on the narrative may be very different than what actually happened. Now some things we know are true, and I don't think you can change uh, the scriptures or you need to even fill in the scriptures, when the angel appeared to Mary and said, will you, will you take on this, this baby, this king of kings and lord of lords, would you be so gracious to do that? And Mary, again, at the time was somewhere between 12 and 14. She maybe was more mature than 12 and 14 year olds nowadays, but she still was young. And she still was um, naive in a lot of ways, I would think. And so she did say yes. She did say yes. Now, Joseph was engaged to her, and this 
this caused a little bit of a riff because she was pregnant and he, by law, he, he could divorce her. They were engaged, but being engaged back then meant like you were married. And so he got a dream. And it's funny to me that his name is Joseph. And Joseph in the Old Testament, the Lord spoke to him through dreams. So here we have Joseph in the New Testament. And God speaks to him through a dream. And he says, you are to marry her. All is good. You are to marry her. And so then, to make things more interesting, here's Mary. Now, you know gossip's going on in the village, in Nazareth. Gossip's going on. And by law, there's a, censor, there's a censorship going on in Nazareth or throughout the country. But Joseph was from, I'm sorry, Joseph was from Bethlehem. And he had to go there for the census. So... It was 90 miles away. Now, for us in a car, it might take us an hour. But they didn't have cars back then. And here's a, a preconception that a lot of us have, is that Mary rode a donkey. Nowhere, read the scriptures over, does it say she rode a donkey. We have interjected that into our narrative. More than likely, they walked. 90 miles is a long way. And back in that day, most people could walk 20 miles a day. Can you imagine? We're dying if we walk one. But they would walk an average of 20 miles a day. But her being pregnant, maybe they walked 10. So it probably took them, oh, oh, close over a week to get to Bethlehem. And the terrain they went wasn't flat. It was hilly, up and down. Um... It was dangerous. And here's another thing I wanted to point out. Where they went, the path they took was not safe. It wasn't always safe. When they went through the forest section, there would be um, um, bandits hiding to kill them, to rob them. So more than likely, they traveled in a caravan. And that made me remember when Jesus went to the temple when he was 12. Remember that story? And they actually went with a caravan. It was safer, and it was probably how most people traveled. Again, back then, life was so different than it is nowadays. People were much more hospitable. So it's very likely that Mary and Joseph stayed at the homes of some friends along the way. And so we have this different uh, outlook of what this journey was like. It was. Not, I know that most of us have imagined it was difficult for Mary being um, nine months pregnant, but I think it was more dangerous than we realize. That when God many times gives us a job to do, and we think it's over the top, it's so great, it's so awesome, then we find out that it's full of danger and peril. It's difficult. It's not easy. But Mary and Joseph... They walked the walk. They went those 90 miles. And when they she went so far, it says that she it was finally time to give birth. Now maybe like Rose, her water broke, and maybe it was and that was signaled it. Maybe she was having heavy contractions. We don't know. But the also, also when we picture them going from end to end to end to end, knocking on the door, that wasn't true either. Joseph had a lot of family in Bethlehem. And because there were, there were so many guests there at the time, the guest rooms were occupied. That's what it means, the guest rooms. So more than likely, maybe he went to a relative's home. And they, this, I think this is pretty interesting. Back then, a lot of people, their animals um, were in the homes. They had a room for the animals right in the homes. So more than likely, that room was available for them. Or they even speculated sometimes there was a cave attached to the house and the animals lived in the cave. And there's a good chance that that's where Jesus was actually born, in a cave. Now the cave was filthy and dirty. And, you know, we like to think when we set out our nativity sets, it's sweet. It's sweet and clean and calm and beautiful and comfortable. And angels are singing. There were no angels singing. 
hate to break that to you. There were no angels singing. Angels appeared to the shepherds, but they weren't singing. And so here's Jesus. He's being born. And also, maybe especially the women wondered, like, well, who helped Mary with the birth? Maybe she had been planning that her mother, her aunts, all her relatives would have been the midwives during her birth back in Nazareth. But here she was in Bethlehem. But back in that day, and especially since there were so many guests, guests, she was probably surrounded by women who were willing to help. Surrounded. So when our little nativity set shows us Jesus and Mary alone, that probably wasn't true either. Jesus was surrounded, surrounded by people, surrounded. And that just changes things for me. It just changes the whole birth narrative for me. It was difficult to get there. When they arrived, it wasn't a palace. It wasn't even a nice room. And Jesus was placed in a manger. That is true. And a lot of the, you know what, I read too that a lot of um, the, the, the inns turned them away because they didn't have the facilities for a baby. They didn't have a crib. They didn't have midwives. They didn't have anything to help. There's so much of the story that Luke and Matthew assume that we know. And I think in the Gospels, that's so true about so many things. We have to dig and find out what, why did Jesus talk about agriculture so much? And why did Jesus talk about um, um, this scenario and that scenario. And it's meaningful. Everything Jesus did was extremely meaningful, probably to the people at the time, more than us until we dig in and find out what he was talking about. So I think my point in all of this is that many times God asks you and me to do something. And we think we jump up and say, yes, I'll be the pastor. Yes, I'll be the intercessor. Yes, I'll be, I'll be the secretary. Yes, I'll do whatever. And we don't stop and think of the journey of where it's going to take us and what it's going to look like. There will be difficult times. There will be dangerous times. There will be perilous times. There will be times... When you say right out loud, I didn't sign up for this. This is not what I thought was going to happen. Can you imagine Mary and Joseph on that journey walking 90 miles? Can you imagine being fearful? And they probably were at times of that journey. Were bandits going to jump out? Can you imagine what Mary might have been thinking? I was asked to deliver this Savior to the world and I might be killed? That would be horrible. I would fail miserably as a servant of God. And there's so many times we feel that way. God, why did you pick me? Why didn't you pick someone else? So in this Christmas season, with all the fluff, and there's so much fluff nowadays in our Christmas season, if we remove the fluff and look at the sharp reality of what the first Christmas was really like, what would we find? We would find a cave, a smelly cave, filthy cave, full, overflowing with people, rejoicing with Mary and Joseph. We would find a husband and a wife and a probably overjoyed, probably numb with the experience of a newborn in their arms. And I'm guessing that because of what had happened to them so far, that they knew they were in for more. And sure enough, we know the rest of the story, Joseph would have another dream and he would, um, they would um, escape from Herod. Their lives were not easy. And sometimes we think that nativity scene, that precious nativity scene is how it really looked, and it really doesn't. We should fill it with all kinds of people. We should fill it with all kinds. Take, take, take 
all those animals out. Maybe there was a sheep. Maybe there was a donkey, maybe. But there weren't a lot of other animals in there. It was Mary, Joseph, and probably his relatives rejoicing on the birth. So, in conclusion, I just want to say that, um, you know, it's it's interesting, too. What did they eat on the journey? They they probably just had filled a... Uh, uh, they probably just filled uh, wineskins with water. For breakfast, they had water and dry bread. And for lunch, maybe they took more water and had oil and bread. And, and then in the evening, they had water and bread again. Jesus said he was the bread of life. He said if you drink from him the water, the living water, you would never thirst again. I think it's so interesting that that's what Mary and Joseph had on their journey. I think everything about the story of Jesus is amazing. And starting at his birth, we know we have hints of his death. So today, and especially on Christmas, reflect on all the characters that were involved that day and all the characters that continue to be involved on that day. You know, when I, I read the story a million times, just as you have, thought about the tender moments of that day. But um, I now realize that it was spectacular. It was life-changing. It was earth-stopping that day. But it shows to us that God is willing to use anybody that's willing, but you really have to be willing to carry out the journey. So, Lord, we know that you came into our world as a babe, you came in as just an innocent, defenseless little babe. And you were surrounded by people that loved you. And angels announced your birth. And then later on, wise men came to look on you, to look on to you, Lord. We know that you are magnificent, even as a babe. And we thank you, Lord, that you, just like your parents, Lord, you took on the mantle, and you walked out the walk. You walked more than 90 miles. You walked more than um, than they did. You walked through treacherous times and difficult times and dangerous times, and you went right to the end, Lord. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being born, for taking on flesh and being born to save this world. In Jesus' name. So this time, take your um, bread, like Mary and Joseph did, three times a day, and on the whole, at least week journey, and thank him for his blood, his body, amen. And Lord, we thank you for your blood. Life is in the blood. Lord, we thank you that you gave us this, Lord. You gave us this gift, which wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for your mother to travel all that way. And it wasn't for you. It wasn't easy for you to travel your journey either. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Old Church, thank you for the birthday wishes. And I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. And um, I just really, Christmas is very different this year for all of us. 
you know, I won't be with my family. I, um, you will be quiet for pastor and me and, um, it will be very different. It will be difficult. I can't say it'll be dangerous, but it will be difficult. Um, but I just, I just am going to really concentrate on the blessings, the blessings from God, the blessings from all of you, and um, meditate on, on the good things. In Jesus' name, have a very, very Merry Christmas. And here is Pastor. Good morning. Well, we are in Advent season heading toward Christmas. The Advent speaks of the coming of the Lord. Now, the coming of the Lord is his incarnation in his first coming, and we, we celebrate this incredible, incredible event, perhaps the most incredible event in human history, God becoming man. In, in the Lord's becoming man, God brings together the human and the divine. The Lord comes down to us as a servant and so gives us a clear understanding of divinity. God's coming down as a servant means that God upends a hierarchical understanding of power, that power is from the top down. The, the, the law and order, the guns and tanks are coming out <clears throat> to enforce law and order from a position of power. And instead, the Lord subverting that image says that power is from the bottom up. It's being a servant. It's the manifestation of God's humility, God's love, God's graciousness, and God's power from the bottom up. From the standpoint of man, God then exalts humanity by becoming man. He brings divinity down to the place of humility and service and exalts humanity to the place of the divine. So the advent, the coming of the Lord is both in his incarnation and his first coming, but advent, his coming, also looks ahead to the second coming. And it is not that the Lord does not have authority. The lamb of the incarnation will be the lion of tribe of Judah, but this is God putting down all the forces that oppose him, not man putting down all the forces that opposes man. It is the Lord in his second coming, establishing his kingdom on the earth and removing all hindrances to that kingdom. Through service, the service of the first coming and through the establishment of his kingly authority in the second coming. So we have this advent, the coming of the Lord, his first coming and his second coming. What does the coming of the Lord mean between the first and the second coming? Well, there's, there's a, a third manifestation of God's coming. There's his coming in the incarnation, his return as King of kings and Lord of lords. But in between, the Lord's coming is seen in a number of examples in Scripture. It is the Lord coming as he comes, as, as Jesus comes in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. The Lord will come to cleanse his church, to purify his church. The Lord will come uh, as he uh, does in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 with Paul. He will come to reveal and make clear foundational issues in his church, in his body. Are, are we the body of Christ? Is the church living according to the gospel? It will be his coming as in Daniel 7, when, when the Son of Man comes and 
reveals that it is his kingdom and not the kingdoms of the earth that exercise ultimate authority in the church. It will be the coming of the Lord as in Psalm 82 when El, the mighty God, the God over all the gods, the God over all the universe, the God over all the nations and all peoples comes and establishes justice where there's injustice. And finally, his advent between the first and the second coming will look like Psalm 50. And that's where we're going today. We're going to go to Psalm 50. Now, what we're dealing with in, in Psalm 50 is the Lord coming in judgment to his people and calling his people to enter into his presence, to see him as he is, to see ourselves the way we are, and to live out according to his purposes. As we spoke of last week, we're in this sequence of Psalms. Uh, book two of the Psalms, the Exodus book, began in Psalm 42. And last week we said 42, 43, and 44. These are all Psalms of the sons of Korah, 42 through 49. Prophetic Psalms. It starts with lament, but then in, in, in verse 45, or chapter 45, Psalm 45, the Lord sends his king, and then in 46 through 48, he established his presence in Zion, his kingship in Zion, and he sings songs of Zion. Zion is the place where the Lord judges the earth, judges his church. Between his first and second coming, the incarnation, the return of Jesus, the lamb and the lion, the Lord's coming is that he dwells in his church. He dwells in the body of Christ. And his presence in the body of Christ reveals the way he works in human history to establish his kingdom. Now, Psalm 50 is a psalm of Asaph. This is also, it's a, it's a momentous project here today that I'm trying to illustrate about the coming of the Lord, the advent of the Lord. Uh, we won't get through it by any stretch of the imagination, but Psalm 50 is a psalm of Asaph, and, and we'll look at that first. And then from Psalm 51 all the way through Psalm 65, we have a series of 15 Psalms of David. It's called the Second David Psalter. We know that in Book 1, Psalms 1 through 41, 38 of those 41 Psalms were attributed to David. Now, the, the Psalms at the start of the second book, 42 through 50, uh, basically those nine Psalms are, are all Psalms, uh, prophetic Psalms. The sons of Korah and then Psalm 50 is of Asaph, and Asaph was a prophetic songwriter, a, a, a prophetic uh, worship leader. And he speaks in Psalm 50, and then we go into this stretch of Davidic Psalms. From 51 through 72, the end of the book, 22 Psalms, um, 18 of those 22 Psalms are attributed to David. And so we, we're we going to go from this high point of, of the songs of Zion and rejoicing to Psalm 50 here, this communal psalm where the Lord summons his people to gather together in his courtroom picture of his advent, of his coming, how he comes and deals with the church between the first and the second coming, along the pattern of the way he dealt with Israel in the Old Testament. We will see this, but then there's a connection between what we see in Psalm 50 and the beginning of David's psalms that start in 51. Let's, let's look at Psalm 50. It's a psalm of Asaph. And one of the things, remember we said the primary name of God that we see in this, this Eloistic Psalter that begins with chapter 42 in the Psalms. Instead of using the name Yahweh, we see the name Elohim. God is named as God as opposed to Yahweh. God as God as Elohim, he's God of all the earth. As Yahweh, he is the God of his people Israel. 
And although we haven't seen the name Yahweh used a lot, when we got to that section, uh, this, this section that where we move from lament into the songs of Zion and the celebration of the Lord's kingship, we start to see the name Yahweh mentioned. Now, one of the cornerstones of Psalm 50 is that the name of the Lord, all the various names of the Lord are used in this psalm. He's called El, the supreme God. He's called Elohim the God of all the earth, the God of the nations. He's called Yahweh, uh, the God uh, of his people Israel. He is called Elo, uh, he's called Elyon, which is the God over all the gods, over all the other gods. He's the highest of all the divine beings in the universe. He created them all and he's uncreated. And then there's Eloah, which is God of justice, which is what Elohim is, the God of justice. But Eloah is the God, the just God toward his people. In fact, it starts out this way. It says, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. It says, El Elohim Yahweh, the supreme God, Yahweh Elohim. He is the supreme God who is the God of his people and the God of all the earth. So it's a, it's an, a spectacular way to speak of God's name, three, three of his names together as one name. And this actually speaks according to rabbinic understanding of, of the attributes of God. As El, he is the one who dispenses his strict steadfast love in the earth, his strict mercy. That's the term chesed. El is associated with chesed. It's the steadfast love of the Lord that he manifests primarily to his people, but it is done in strict accordance with who he is. There, there is an acknowledgement of who God is. Psalm 50 is going to speak to the fact that we need to see God as he is and we need to see ourselves as we are and hence worship him correctly. That's the judgment that we're going to see in Psalm 50. That's who he is as El. El is associated with chesed. Elohim is associated with the justice of the Lord because he's God of all the earth and he renders his justice to his people and to all the nations of the earth. You cannot escape the justice of God. The justice of God is not just something that is for God's people. It's for all the nations of the earth. And that's why in Psalm 82, which I referenced, uh, another aspect of God's advent, his coming, he comes when there is injustice, when any nation begins to walk in injustice, Elohim comes and he renders justice in the earth. He tries to get the nations right through his judgment. That's El Elohim. Has said God's justice, his, his mishpat, and then Yahweh, of course, is the attribute of tender mercy. Racham, God's tender, merciful compassion that he manifests to his people, those who are in union with him. Now, I want to quote something from a rabbinic commentary that kind of summarizes what is going on in Psalm 50 before we, we read the rest of it. The rabbi said, this psalm describes the intense desire of the creator to reveal himself to his beloved Israel. This powerful desire is truly the yearning of a father who wants to envelop his son in his protective embrace. However, God cannot reveal and manifest his presence to his children until they too demonstrate a sincere desire to draw near to him. And that's the New Testament verse. Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. This is God's coming, his advent in Psalm 50. So El Elohim Yahweh, the dispenser of steadfast love, the dispenser of justice, the dispenser of tender mercies, speaks, he cries out, he declares, and he calls and summons the earth 
from the rising of the sun to its setting. Now the Lord is going to speak and he's calling the entire earth, his created earth into his throne room of judgment. He's calling them in from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Now the place where God's courtroom is located is Zion, the place of his presence. And Zion is his holy hill. Zion is the perfection of beauty. Zion is the church. So the Lord summons the entire earth and the church to the place of his presence. Verse three says, our God comes and he does not keep silence. Now there's going to be a description later on this in this psalm that God remains silent. But there are times when God remains silent and there are times when God speaks. In times of silence, God's people tend to think that that means God agrees with everything they're doing. It doesn't, and we'll see that here in this psalm. But there comes a time when God writes the flawed thinking of his people and the flawed thinking of his church. He comes in a special, manifest, tangible way, as in Revelation 1, and sets things Correct. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above. He calls the earth to this place of his descent, his coming, his theophany, his manifestation. He calls the earth, he calls the heavens, and he calls his church into his throne room of judgment. Now, this picture that we see here in verse 4 and verse 3, before him is a devouring fire, around him is a mighty tempest, is a picture of a theophany. And by theophany, we mean the Lord coming down to earth and revealing himself. He comes down from the heavens to the earth. That's what the coming of the Lord means. That's what judgment means. There, God is everywhere. He's transcendent. God is everywhere. Whether we sense him or not, he is there. But there are special times when the Lord unveils himself, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Christ. The Lord comes in a theophany. He comes tangibly, clearly, and everything that is wrong is made right. The confusion is undone. The truth is manifested. And that's what happens in a theophany. And this is what we are expecting this Christmas season. We expect the Lord to come between the first coming of the incarnation, which Pastor Jan described from Luke and Matthew, the second coming, which we see at the end of the book of Revelation, and everything in between, it's a theophany. The Lord is coming, and things need to be set straight in the body of Christ. Now, what's very important here is the Lord is going to speak, and in speaking, speaking, we are going to see what he's doing. The emphasis is on his speech, what he is going to say, the, the judicial judgment that he's going to render concerning the church, concerning the earth, concerning America, concerning the nations of the earth, concerning the gospel, concerning his kingdom. And I liken this theophany to Exodus 19. Keep a hand in Psalm 50 and turn with me to Exodus 19. The Lord, after he brings his children, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt with a mighty outstretched arm, he delivers them from their oppressors. Then he meets them on Mount Sinai. And the emphasis on Mount Sinai is his speaking. We must hear the Lord. Exodus 19.1 says, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. 
the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, you shall thus, key word, say to the house of Israel, to the house of Jacob and the people of Israel, tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen, there's the issue of sight, what I did to the Egyptians. That's redemption. God redeems, but after the redemption, God offers sacrifice, but after the sacrifice, the Lord himself appears and speaks. You saw me then, you need to hear me now. We have seen what God has done in Jesus Christ. Everybody who's a Christian is celebrating what God has done in Jesus Christ, but we must hear what God speaks concerning what he has done in Jesus Christ. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my what? My voice. God will speak, Psalm 50, verse 1 says. El Elohim Yahweh speaks. God will not keep silent. There comes a time. There's a time of sacrifice, and we rejoice in that. Sacrifice is the Lord delivering his people through Jesus and raising in us a spirit of worship, and God accepts that. But we must also hear his voice along with the redemption and the praise and the right standing and the justification in faith that God brings. And we need to hear him speak concerning his kingdom purposes in the earth. Remember, Psalms is an eschatological book. It gives us a pattern of how God works out his kingdom purposes in human history. And this is Exodus, by the way. Exodus 19, Exodus 34 are both being alluded to in Psalm 50 because we're in the Exodus book establishing the proper behavior that constitutes being part of God's people. These are the names. That's Exodus, Shemoth in Hebrew. These are the names. What does it mean to be part of the people of God? What constitutes membership among the covenant people of God? If you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, hearing and keeping the covenant. You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine. Everything in the earth belongs to me. And the Lord's going to say that in Psalm 50. Everything in the earth belongs to me. This isn't about what you do for me. This is what I'm doing for you. That's the real basis of redemption and the real basis of the Lord establishing his kingdom in the earth. It's what God has done for us, is doing for us, and will do for us, and not so much what we're called to do for him. And you shall be to me, if you hear my voice, keep my covenant, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There's the nation of the Lord. There's the kingdom of the Lord. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before him all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. What the Lord has spoken, we need to hear his voice speak. And when the Lord comes in special seasons, special ways, special times and manifests his presence, to his church, and to the world in a special way. It is so we might hear the voice of the Lord and say all that he has spoken, we will perform, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, and here's, here's the theophany that we see in, in, in 50 verse 4 and 50 verse 3 of the psalm. When Moses told the words, uh, uh, Moses, and the Lord said to Moses, verse 9, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. See, the, he came, they saw him. 
when they came out of Egypt, but now they need to hear him. The emphasis here is hearing. It's not that we see or hear, we do both, but we see him and what he's done through Jesus for us, redeemed us, the perfect offering, the perfect sacrifice. We hear then, as we become constituted as sons of God, then we hear his voice and we comply with that voice. I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Zion in the sight of all the people. So it's second sight. It's hearing that's a second sight from the first sight of redemption. It's if, if, if we want to look at it in terms of a, a New Testament pattern, it's justification and redemption. It is sanctification. Make yourselves holy, consecrate yourself, devote yourself. And see, remember what devotion to the Lord is, what real sanctification is. It is that we devote ourselves to the Lord and his purpose. We enter into a relationship with him. And that's going to be the emphasis in Psalm 50. Now, on your way back to Psalm 50, and you can go there, Jesus works this this pattern out in the Gospel of John chapter 5, where in 519 he says, I only do what I see my Father doing. And then in verse 30 of John 5, he says, as I hear the Father speak, what he says, that's what I base my judgments on, my discernment, my wisdom, my strategy. This is what I base my life on, what I hear him doing. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The whole point in hearing the Lord is that we seek not our own will but the will of the one who sent us. And in doing so, we see what the Father is doing. So Jesus, just like in Exodus 19 and, 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 and Exodus 14 before that, where the Lord delivered them from uh, Egypt in chapter 14 and descends on Sinai in chapter 19 of Exodus, Jesus in verse 19 of John 5 sees the Father and in Chapter verse 30 of chapter 5 of John, he hears the Father. And he says, my judgment is just. See, it's to hear the Father is to enter into the throne room of judgment. So let's pick up back again. Let's go back to Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him, a mighty tempest. He's already summoned the earth in verse 1. And now he summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Now, the Hebrew word for judge there is render a judicial decision based on discernment. Discernment means to see what's really there. See, the church right now is in the midst of confusion, division, false prophecy, false teaching. We need God to come and render a judicial decision. He needs to render judgment discernment that causes us to see what's really going on. And he's going to come as he does in Exodus 19, and he's going to come as he does in Revelation chapter 1. He's going to come as he does in Psalm 82. He's going to come as he does in Daniel 7. He's going to come, as Paul says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes in 1 Corinthians 4. And he's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about the Lord coming in one of these special advents to manifest himself to the church that we hear his voice and we comply. And notice what he calls out when he says he's coming to judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones, my hased ones. Gather to me those who are devoted to me as a father and my steadfast love, gather my chesed ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. He's gathering those who are in covenant relationship with him because of 
the sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, it was the sacrifices offered in the temple that prefigured the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. What this verse says to us is gather my chesed ones, the ones who walk in my grace, the ones who walk in my steadfast love, who have embraced the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for their sins, for their justification, for their deliverance, and for their righteousness. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Everybody say forever and bow down and worship. Now that's the second term for judgment. It's judgment based on discernment. This is judgment based on his justice. God wants to establish justice. So we have El, the attribute of God's chesed, his steadfast love. We see now the one who will render justice, that's Elohim, who renders justice in the world and in his church. And now the Lord begins to speak. This is a prophetic utterance. Asaph is writing the psalm in the third person, and now he speaks in first person. He's writing about God in the first six verses and in verse seven. Now the Lord is speaking, just as he was speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai and through Moses, he's speaking through Asaph here. And this is when we're called into his throne room of judgment. This is what he says. Hear my people, hearken to me. That's that Shema. Hearken to me, not just hear with your outward ear, hear with from deep within your inner man, depth, deep in the, the depths of your being. Respond to me. It's hear and respond in devotion and love and faith and obedience. Hear my people and I will speak, O Israel, and I will bear witness against you. Now we're talking about a courtroom situation. I'm going to bear witness. You know, you have witnesses in every courtroom situation. Whether we see this as criminal law or civil law, you have witnesses to establish the truth. The Lord is the judge and the witness. He can do that. He's the king. He's the judge. He's the witness. He's the, he's the attorney. He's a, he's the police force. He's all of those things. God is all of those things. And what is he going to bear witness against? But first of all, how is he going to bear witness? I am God, your God. I'm Elohim, the God of justice. But now he says, but I am Elohim as your Elohenu. I am your personal God of justice. He is Elohim. And let me read the correct Hebrew. I said Eleheinu. It's actually, I'm looking in my Hebrew text. He's Eleheka. I'm your Elohim. So I'm going to render justice, but I'm going to render justice the way I would to my people, not to those who are not my people. That's how I'm going to do it. And here's, here's his testimony. He goes, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. Your offerings. It's interesting that the Hebrew word that, that oversees all the, 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 the offerings, all the, all the category of offerings is korban, which means to draw near. And, and the Lord is saying, in, you draw near to me, I'm not judging the sacrifice. I'm not judging the sacrifice of my son. I'm not judging the fact that you've accepted the sacrifice of my son. I'm not accepted that that I'm not judging that that sacrifice has made you righteous. Of course I'm not doing that. Your whole burnt offerings, the burnt offerings are the offerings of of devotion on the Lord. I'm not judging your worship, but I'm judging distortions of worship that you yourself might have. You're, the worship is valid. There's no problem with the worship, but the issue is with you. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. So the Lord begins now to correct false understandings of worship and redemption that God's people may have. The redemption is not, there's nothing wrong with redemption and worship. There's nothing wrong in saying, I believe in Jesus and I worship God 
based on my faith in Jesus Christ. That's not what he's judging. But he's saying, but then we walk away from the truth of that redemption with flawed concepts. And he's correcting what he would call pagan concepts of worship. See, we can worship the true God and we can worship him correctly. We can only worship him because we're in Christ, because his blood cleanses us. But we may walk away with false conceptions of God's worship. We can have true worship that we are involved with, but we have flawed concepts of worship, pagan, if you will, concepts of worship. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. The goats was offering for the poor. The bull was the greatest of all offerings, the sin offering. The bull represents the, the offerings of powerful offerings. The goat, just a slight offering. They're both offerings. He goes, listen, it's you're not doing me a favor by bringing me offerings. See, there's a flawed concept. We're doing something for God for which God then needs to pay us back. No, offerings are for us. God does what he does for us. We don't do what we do for him. Even what we do for him is for us. He says, I am the Lord of all the earth. Everything is mine. That's what he said in Exodus 19. He said, every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hill. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. You can't give me anything from created, from the created order, from creation that gives something back to me. It already belongs to me. And he, he names all kinds of categories there. There are, there are every, there are the, the wild beasts of the forest. The sacrifices were domesticated beasts. The beasts of the forest were wild. The cattle, actually in Hebrew, is the behemoth. These, these, these gigantic, uh, uh, massive, uncontrollable, undomesticated animals. All the birds of the hills, everything that moves in the field, insects and, and, and reptiles. You can't give me everything, anything. Nothing that you do adds anything to me. What I do adds something to you and what you do toward me adds something for you. The Lord is 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 breaking us from understanding that we have anything to do with our redemption. It's all about Jesus. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. Now that was another pagan conception is you offer sacrifices to gods so the gods can feed themselves. That's a highly paganistic view. God says, you, you can't feed me. I don't need you to feed me. I'm here to feed you. I'm here to redeem you. I'm here to give to you. And then the Lord says, here's what I'm looking for. And this is now God speaking in judgment. The sacrifice you're, you're saying, I believe in Jesus. I'm redeemed by Jesus's blood. I confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. No problem with that. But I'm going to speak to you now about consecration and devotion. If those things are true, then here's what I desire. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, a toda. Thanksgiving, it's interesting. The, the Hebrew word for, for thanksgiving uh, is both to give thanks and to confess. Toda means the same thing. In some contexts, it has to do with confessing sin. In other contexts, it has to do with giving thanks to God. And the point of that is this, is real worship, real thanksgiving. The purpose of real worship is that we confess God and see him as he is, and in our confession, we see ourselves as the way we are. This is where the church has gotten muddled. There's lack of thankfulness in our hearts because we have we don't see God for who he really is. We have so many false pagan concepts of God. And see, our pagan concepts of God get superimposed on the leaders we follow. When we have a wrong conception of who God is, the God of steadfast love, the God of justice, the God of tender, compassionate mercies and grace. 
When we have a wrong concept of God, we take those wrong concepts of God and we follow leaders who look like our concept of God instead of God's concept of God. Oh, that's being dealt with right now in America. It's being dealt with by God in America. Oh, this great leader, this horrible leader, this tremendous leader, God is our leader. And now we are coming into the throne room of his judgment in this hour and we need to see him as he is. And the first thing is we confess. We confess who he is and we confess who we are. And we give thanks. The first thing he wants, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows. You will obey me, says the Lord. In Exodus 19, when he speaks, to perform our vows mean that we perform our promises to God. And our promises to God, according to Exodus 19, is we hear you, Lord, and we will listen to your voice. And the third thing God wants is, and call upon me. In the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. It's seeing God doing what he does for us. It is confessing who he is and who we are, and it is obeying him, performing our promises. And interestingly, it's performing our promises there. It says to Elion, the most high God. Elion is the God over all the powers and principalities of the earth. We are obedient to him in the shadow of the empires and the nations we serve. We don't conform to the patriotic standards of our nation. We conform to the one who is Lord over powers and principalities. We are called to be good citizens, but that's secondary. The Lord is saying, get those pagan notions that that devotion to a, your nation is more important than devotion to your God. So he asks those three things, and then the Lord calls to the wicked. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. The Lord now, he summoned the Hesed ones, and now he's summoning the wicked. And the wicked are the rebellious among his people. But to the rebellious, God says, and then he cites the four commandments from the Ten Commandments are, are cited here. He cites, you shall not steal. He cites, you shall not commit adultery. He cites, you shall not bear false witness. And fourth, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And watch how he does it. What right have you to recite my statutes and take my covenant on your lips? Remember the Lord called them in Exodus 19 to embrace the covenant of the Lord. Well, he says, what right do you have? What right do you have? This is what God deals with us when we're in the throne room of judgment. What right do you have to recite my statutes and take my covenant on your lips? He wants the covenant in our heart, not our lips. This people worships me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It's interesting. You also recite my statutes. The Hebrew word hawk is statutes there. And statutes have to do with the things in the law of God, the things in the covenant of the of, of God that he makes with his people that don't make sense to our rational mind. See, see, there are a lot of things in, in Scripture that make a whole lot of sense to us. There are a lot of things that don't make sense. And what he's saying is, is rebels follow their own train of thought. They determine what's good and evil. They do not embrace the statutes of the Lord when God tells us to do things that violate our sense of reason, our sense of good and evil, our sense of dignity. He says, that's what, that's a sign of rebels. And see, rebels are confused by false teaching and false prophecy. And, and, and when God speaks clearly, it doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't fit with their framework and 
conceptualization of the way the world should work and the way America should work and, 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 and the way God should, should be hearing my prayers and answering things according to my standards. The Lord says, that's a sign of rebellion. Then he says, you hate discipline. The rebellious hate discipline. The Lord is disciplining his church right now in this hour. Whatever is the outcome of this election, God is judging. God is disciplining his church and bringing his church back to God, away from all these other false gods and back to God. We cannot hate the discipline of the Lord. And you cast my words behind you. You just throw them, throw them behind you. And where you're looking at is what makes sense to you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. You cast your lot with adulterers. You run with thieves. Notice it doesn't say you're a thief or you're adulterer. It says you approve of thieves and adulterers. Lord, show us the thieves and the adulterers right now that are trying to steal your covenant, your presence, your judgment, your discernment, your justice from your church. You give your mouth free reign for evil and your tongue frames falsehood. You propagate the evil that others say. You propagate the false prophecies that others are giving. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your mother's son, bearing false witness, taking the name of the Lord in vain. You know what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain? As the church, the Lord's name is over us. That's why Paul says, because of you, the name of the Lord is blasphemed among the nations. He's quoting an Old Testament verse and he's speaking to the, to, to one of his churches and saying, because of the, because we don't faithfully live out the testimony of the Lord, we don't hear his voice, respond to it in obedience. The name of the Lord is in vain. The Lord's name then gets associated with our deeds instead of his righteousness, truth, grace, and mercy. These things you have done, and I have been silent. See, the Lord is silent. He's waiting for us to come around. But when we don't come around, he speaks. These things you have done, and I have been silent, and you thought that I was like yourself. Remember what I said at the start? See, when God is silent, well, God approves of what I, I, I'm doing. He hasn't said anything opposite of what I'm, what I think and feel and do. Well, he doesn't have to. It's written in the word. And see, when Christians get away from the word and they get caught up in false prophecy, it's just, they're getting caught up in, they're just reinforcing flawed, false, untrue ideas that are inconsistent with the word. So finally, the Lord says, okay, you think I'm like you because I'm silent. Okay, dig out your ears and listen. And that's why he says, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. I lay this legal indictment against you, my judgment. Now turn to me. Mark this then. Your mind has drifted away from God. Now focus your mind on what I'm saying. Mark this then, you who forget God. And the Hebrew for forget means it, it's not talking about just God kind of just drifted away. It's a purposeful, deliberate, deliberate pushing God out of your mind and pushing his word out of your mind. When you do that, do you think you're setting yourself up within that, the, oh, I hear the voice of the Lord. If you push the Lord away, what you're hearing is what you want to hear or what you think you're hearing or what you feel you should be hearing. So many, every, so many people are not saying, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. And I've said it over and over and over again, Jeremiah 23. They speak a word that comes from the imagination of their own heart and not from the mouth of God. Hear me. When God speaks in judgment, listen to the mouth. He says, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. And he's calling all the wicked 
and all the steadfast loved ones, the chesed ones, to the place where they confess him for who he is, see themselves the way they are, purge themselves of all foreign manners of worship and living, ordering their way rightly, and the Lord will show their salvation, his salvation to them. Now, I should stop here, right? But I got to do Psalm 51. What is next? Psalm 51. Look at it, verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Why is the very first Psalm of David positioned right after Psalm 50? Because the Lord is calling his people into repentance in Psalm 50. In the throne room of judgment, God calls us into repentance. And David's sin with Bathsheba, adultery, and David's sin with Uriah, murder, again, violations of the commandments, just like there were violations of the commandments at the end of Psalm 50 there, the Lord is saying, those of you who are walking in wickedness, who are rebelling against me, I am calling you in to the throne room of my judgment for confession, thanksgiving to God by confessing who he is and confessing who you are. You have committed adultery. You have run with thieves. You have slandered your brothers and sisters. You have taken the name of the Lord your God in vain. You have blood on your hands. And so David, Psalm 51, is a picture of the repentance that God is requiring in Psalm 50. If the Lord is going to come to his church in this hour as Psalm 50, we better be prepared to be confronted with our sin in Psalm 51. Now, what's unusual about this, and this begins a series, there are 15 consecutive psalms of David that run from 51 to 65. 51 is out of place. David, historically, is the king when he committed the sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. The psalms that follow this all deal with Saul coming after David and and betrayal uh, among God's people and supporters of Saul. All, all the things that come after it, it's out of sequence. Why is Psalm 51 put before all the times where David has to escape from Saul? Because Psalm 51 may not be in sequence, but it's showing, it's, it's not in sequence in terms of how the events happen, but theologically it's in sequence. David's kingship is rooted in repentance. David has enemies. David has betrayal. David has oppression. David has people out after his life. David has confusion. David has turmoil. But God delivers him from all of those. But what God sets first in terms of establishing David's kingship, and actually the remainder of the book will go from Psalm 51 to Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is a psalm of Solomon or a psalm for Solomon. Solomon is the son of David and the one who carries on the kingship of David. And so the end of this is, is this is the real meaning of how our kingship is established. We raise up disciples. We impart our vision to our sons and daughters. But the key is repentance. Now, if you look at Psalm 51, and it runs to Psalm 65, that's, that's where this, this, this group of 15 Psalms by David progress. Psalm 51 is about repentance. Look at, that's the first of the series of these 15 Psalms in a row. Look just briefly at Psalm 65, which is the last of the 15 in a row. And this is what Psalm 65 says, 51 starts with repentance, and look at what 65 starts with. 65 starts with repentance. 65, one, praise is due you, O God, in Zion, that's the place of his judgment, and to you shall vows be performed. The promises that the Lord requires his people to perform in Psalm 50 are also by David. This is a Psalm of David. 
O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts, drawing near the whole sacrificial system, repentance, relationship, healing, cleansing, devotion, restoration. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temples. Verse three, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Psalm 51 starts with forgiveness of sin. Psalm 65, the sequence of Davidic Psalms in a row in book two starts with forgiveness. Now let's read with David. David says in 51.1, have mercy on me, O God. Grant me your grace according to your steadfast love. Grant me grace according to your chesed, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. And we have Raham. We have everything. We have chesed. We have Hanan. We have Raham, God's grace, God's steadfast love, God's mercy. And he says, blot out my transgressions. Erase them. Eliminate them. Remove them. And the very first sin that David makes reference to is according to your mercy, your grace, and your steadfast love, blot out my pasha. That's the most serious level of sin, my intentional rebellion against you. Now remember, there are unintentional sins and there are intentional sins. Intentional sins are considered high-handed sins, high-handed. They're shaking the fist against God because they're willfully performed. And in the Old Testament, it was there was always a question of whether those sins could be atoned for. Unintentional sin is the things we just do because we're human, human foolishness. Atonement took care of that. In fact, there are three words for sin, and David applies every one of them to his life. There's rebellion, there's iniquity, and there is sin. Rebellion is pasha here, iniquity is aven, and sin is chata. Pasha is rebellion because it disrupts the order of justice that God has set forth in the universe. Aven speaks of the destructive power of sin. It's the fact that when we sin, it doesn't just affect us, it affects others. And chata is those foolish sins that we correct that keep us from reaching our goals, from attaining to our destiny. And Paul or uh, David says, cover all of them. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Blot out my transgressions. Deal with all these dimensions of sin. For I know my transgressions. I know what I did with Bathsheba and Uriah was direct rebellion against you, Lord. My sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He understands his sin has horribly affected others, but he understands that ultimately you can hide sin from others, but all sin cannot be hidden from God. And he says, I say this, not because my sin doesn't have practical implications for other people. It does, and we'll see at the end of this psalm how significant it is. But he says, I say this so that you might be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment so that when you judge man for sin, you, Lord God, are righteous. You are blameless. The consequences of sin that people shake their fist toward God, why did this, why, if God's such a good God, why does he let this happen? No, you let it happen. You let it happen by your sin. And then he speaks not so much of a doctrine of original sin, but how everything that human beings do from their very conception and birth and into life is just surrounded and tainted and embedded in sin. Sin is in the earth. It's in the world. 
He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Coming out of the womb, I'm surrounded by sin. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward part, in my inward being, and you will teach me wisdom in the secret places. This is when God brings his people into judgment, as in Psalm 50, as David is confronted, as he's become one of the wicked, one of the ones who's rebelled against the Lord and being confronted with his sin and repenting, he understands that what God does is he brings forth truth in our inner being. See, we need to understand what's really going on. Because of sin, we're blinded. Because of sin, we're deceived. Because of sin, we don't hear the word of the Lord correctly. Because of sin, we run with thieves and adulterers. Because of sin, we slander each other and we propagate evil from our mouths. We do these things because of sin. But when we confess, we acknowledge him for who he is, confess our sin and acknowledge ourselves for who we are, this thankfulness then, truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, he makes us to know wisdom. Wisdom means, truth means we have the, we have authentic reality. We see things the way God sees things. Wisdom means we take what we've heard God say and what we've seen God do and we work it out into our lives. That's what wisdom is. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The purging with hyssop was the ritual whereby a leper was declared clean. It was to be purged with hyssop was when a person who was accused of guilt was rendered innocent by God. David is saying, I'm a leper. It was the, the right when a, a person touched a dead corpse and was rendered unclean. When death came toward a person, when death touched a person's life, you purge with hyssop and you are made clean. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have crushed may rejoice. Things that were rendered unclean in the house of God had to be crushed. If a vessel was rendered impure, it had to be crushed. If a stove was rendered impure, it had to be crushed. When the Lord says, or when David says to the Lord, the bones which you've crushed will rejoice, the Lord is taking that which is unclean in us, crushing us, and making us a new vessel, making us into a new stove for the Lord's purposes. And when God does that, we will hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from me, blot out my iniquities. He talked about blot out my transgressions. Erase is the Hebrew. Erase my rebellion. Erase the devastation that my sin has caused. That's powerful, brethren. That's powerful. God can do this when we confess, when we declare who he is, when we see ourselves for who we are and we give thanks because of who he is. When he comes to render judgment in Psalm 50, it's not to destroy his people, it's to repair his people. And then look at everything that takes place. This is what David is crying out to God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Create, make something that's not there. Give me a new heart. He's, this is actually David's prophesying what, what Ezekiel's gonna say, what Jeremiah's gonna say, what Isaiah's gonna say, prophesying about, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put my spirit in you. I'll make a new covenant with you. What Isaiah's gonna say in chapters 40 through 66, I'm gonna restore you from exile. Create in me a clean heart is the first thing. Second, Give me a new and a right spirit. Renew a right spirit within me. Give me a new spirit. Give me a right spirit. A right spirit is a deliberate spirit. A deliberate spirit that agrees to be obedient to the Lord, to follow in his ways. 
Cast me not away from your presence. Don't remove me from Zion. I want to dwell in Zion. I want your presence. Your presence hasn't been with me. You know, from the time David sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah and the time that Nathan confronted him, it was about a year. David lived in hell for a year because he was out of the presence of the Lord for a year till Nathan came to him. Cast me not away from your presence. To be cast away means to be thrown into exile, away from the presence of the Lord, into a land run by idolaters. I don't want to live in a land run by idolaters, and I don't care if that land's name is America. I want to be in the in Zion, the place of God's presence. If America listens, America listens. If America doesn't listen, I live in Zion. All my springs, all my fountains are in you, Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. I want the Holy Spirit, the one who sanctifies me and causes me to be devoted to you. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit, with a free will offering. Psalm 110 said this, your people will be free will offerings in the day of your power. They will be willing in the day of your power. What's the day of God's power? Psalm 50 and Psalm 51. Coming into the throne room of the Lord and repenting and acknowledging him for who he is and worshiping him properly and being obedient to him and watching him deliver us in the day of trouble. Oh, the church just doesn't know what's happening to our country. The church knows what's happening to our country. We pray for our country. We pray for our nation. But what we want to see is God deliver his people in the day of trouble. And whatever has to take place in the country for God to do that to his people, then he does it. He's God, we're not. It doesn't fit with our patterns of reasoning. God, he spoke through Jeremiah, I need to use you to tear down before I can build up. If this is an hour where the nation gets torn down, brethren, blessed be the name of the Lord. If this is an hour when God spares this nation and saves this nation, blessed be the name of the Lord. If this be an hour where God does neither of those and does something none of us has expected, blessed be the name of the Lord. Make me a free will offering. Let my spirit be an, a free will offering to you, Lord God. And the free will offering was what you gave to the Lord when you just thanked him for the wonderful things that he'd done in your life. Then I will teach transgressors your way. Other rebels, other high-handed sinners, those deceived in the body of Christ right now will be taught by those who repent. It's not this thing about we're right and you're wrong. You're wrong and we're right. It's about repentance. And those who repent, those who see God for who he is and see ourselves the way we are and give thanks, they'll teach those who are wrong the right way. Because there's a lot of transgression going on in the body of Christ. And there's a lot of rebellion. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Both aspects of sin, intentional sin and unintentional sin, will be reconciled to God by those who've repented and give him thanks. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. He not only committed adultery, Bathsheba, he was guilty of murder, blood guilt. And he says, when you deliver me from this, Lord, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Now see, real praise and real worship comes forth from a repentant heart that has stood in the judgment of the Lord, the throne room of God's judgment, and God speaks and we respond. O Lord, open my lips, my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice. Now see, it's connecting back with Psalm 50. I don't have any problems with your sacrifices. I have problems with you. I don't have any problems with faith in Jesus. I don't mean, God doesn't have any problems in what Jesus did. What Jesus did took care of it all. The problem's not with Jesus. The problem's not with the sacrifice. The problem's not what we put our faith in. We put our faith in Jesus. The problem's with us, our transgression. 
our inability to obey the Lord, our wandering away from God. For you do not delight simply in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken spirit is someone who's been humbled. A contrite heart is one who's been crushed. The bones which you have crushed will rejoice. It's the same word. God wants to crush the power of sin, the power of uncleanness from our lives, and he wants to humble us. Church, God does not want you want to justify the prophecies you're hearing about life and America and the church. God's not looking to justify anybody right now. God is looking to humble us, to acknowledge him the way he is, to see who really real godly leaders are, to walk in his justice, to walk in his shalom, to walk in his blessing. He wants to humble us and he wants to crush the power of uncleanness that's at work in our hearts. So this battle about who's right and who's wrong, there's such, there's, there's this, this division in the body of Christ raging over who's right and who's wrong right now. That is part of the problem. That is the problem. The division is the part of the problem, not who's right and who's wrong. The division, the resultant division that even causes us to have an argument like this. And this isn't an argument that started in, in, in America, didn't start 50 years ago. It didn't start 160 years ago. It didn't start 400 years ago. It started way, way back in church history when we decided to do things our way instead of the Lord's way. God is dealing with us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and crushed heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Now, he, he, he concludes, he concludes with Zion again. Do good in Zion. He's back to Zion. The songs of Zion that we saw in 45, 46, 47, 48. Zion, the place of God's presence. Zion that we saw in Psalm 50. He's back to Zion. He says, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. David goes from a whole psalm dealing with his individual sin, verses 1 through 17, and then in 18 and 19, he says, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Why did the walls of Zion have to be rebuilt? David, you sinned. Why, why do Zion's walls have to be rebuilt? And this is so important to us. When leaders in the body of Christ sin, it destroys the walls that protect the entire church. When leaders in the body of Christ embrace false prophecy, false prophecy is spread through the whole church. When leaders in Christ teach false teaching, it tears apart Jerusalem. When leaders are more interested in their own personal woundedness, their own personal agendas, their own personal kingdoms, it destroys the walls of Jerusalem. David has just gone through the anguish of all the devastation that his sin has caused. And actually, if we continue in the Psalms that follow this, there's more devastation. And it's rooted in what happened with him and Bathsheba and Uriah. But David realizes it's not just what he's done. It's what he, the devastation his sin, his sin has caused others. If there has ever been an hour in the body of Christ where the leaders of the church, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, the word of God says to you, the Lord is going to humble us, bring us into repentance, 
bring us into the throne room of his judgment. There has never been a time when the church is so devastated because of such flawed leadership in the body of Christ. That's why David poses with, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in sacrifice. No problem with the sacrifice. No problem with the sacrifice of Christ. But as leaders, as members of the body of Christ, do our lives represent the life of Christ who gave that sacrifice. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. And he goes right back to Psalm 50. Those are the very things that he spoke of in Psalm 50. And what did he also did he say in Psalm 50? He said, I don't want goats or bulls from you. Well, what does he say here? Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And the bull symbolized the the sin offering, but it symbolized in the strongest of all the domesticated animals, God cut into the strength of that animal and it was an acceptable sin offering to him. This is an hour where the, it's not just the weakness of God's people needs to be covered. The strength of God's people, God's people were bulls in a china shop. We've, we've run amok away from the Lord, following our own patterns of reasoning instead of doing it his way. But when God brings us into the throne room of his judgment, then, then, then he will judge and accept. Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. The church in this hour is coming into the throne room of your judgment. We are being humbled and in, in that humility, the power of sin is being broken. And Lord, those areas of uncleanness where we have passed on evil and uncleanness, and we have actually inculcated rebellion in the house of God, it's being crushed, it's being broken. And Lord, we must see this, Lord. We must see and we must understand and we must know, oh God, what you're doing in this hour. We are in the throne room of your judgment, Lord. Judge us, O God. May we see what you're doing. May we hear your voice. May we give thanks. May we perform our promises, Lord. And may we rejoice in the great deliverance that you're going to accomplish. Let it not be forgotten. You're doing all these things to show us your righteousness, that you are our deliverer your steadfast love that you are with us, your truth, your wisdom, your grace, your tender mercies. Be with your people. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. I want to remind everybody we're going to be back online at 1 o'clock. You can go through the uh, Lord of the Harvest Facebook page, Lord of the Harvest YouTube. Uh, YouTube. <laughs> uh, there's a link for that. Uh, you'll see it on the website. You, 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 you can get on uh, the way you get on for our live stream worship, our live stream sermon, and, and watch and rejoice with us with our, our virtual Sunday school celebration of Christmas. In Jesus' name, we'll see you back at one. Amen.